Well, hello, everybody. Uh, good morning to most of us. Uh, I guess just afternoon for those on the East Coast. So we're going to talk about pain in dentistry, but also inflammation and, and how we deal with these aspects. And my, there we go. Now we're, now we're cooking with gas. So as we look at oral and dental pain, there are certainly many areas where we can have pain and inflammation, periodontal disease. We'll talk a little bit about that. We'll talk about fractured teeth. We'll talk about tooth resorption, uh, especially in cats and certainly with any kind of trauma. We'll also talk about certain conditions that have chronic pain issues with the oral cavity. And then with all of these, we wanna see what we can do both during our operative time periods and extra operative. When we do have those chronic situations, what we can do to help manage this pain and make our patients more comfortable. There's a lot of times we talk about dental pain and people kind of understand what, uh, what these issues are. If you've ever had a, a painful condition, it can really make your life miserable. And I think some of our patients may be a little bit tougher than we are, but it's still an aspect that we want to make sure that we keep our patients as comfortable as possible. One of the interesting things about oral and dental pain, when you're actually looking at the tooth itself, beyond the gums and bone and everything else, there are specific neurons that have A, delta, and C fibers, and they can transmit heat, cold, pressure, pain, all, all the different sensations, but what gets perceived by the brain is just pain. In other words, when they're doing a cold test on a tooth to see if you have pulpitis, they'll use a very, uh, a cold tester and you won't tell that it's cold or hot, you'll just feel pain. That is a good protective mechanism because certainly if we don't have a lot of care for an animal out in the wild and we're starting to have problems with our teeth, teeth are important to be able to prehend food and eat food. So we need to do something about it when there is discomfort. Periodontal disease for the most part is considered a silent disease even in people because it often starts out slowly we start getting inflama inflammation and infection and bone loss and gum loss. It usually doesn't have excruciating pain, even with extensive disease, because it happens so gradually. In fact, how many times have you seen a mouth like this and the pet's still eating fine? Okay. Maybe when a tooth gets loose or even gets knocked loose to where you can't close the mouth anymore, then they might show some discomfort. The key of it is we talk about the infection of dental disease and we talk about the bacteria that gets in the bloodstream and that can impact the other systemic organs, heart, kidney, liver, you name it. The important part of it is it may be simpler to talk about bacterial infection, but especially with people, it goes beyond that. It's actually the presence of this chronic inflammation that causes as many of the systemic issues as we see. Not just the bacteria, not just the bacteremia. It's those cytokines, C-reactive proteins, things like this. When we have that chronic inflammation that is not treated, that's where we can have additional problems with our organ systems. So certainly if there's a mobile tooth or if we have ulcerative disease, cats with stomatitis, dogs with contact ulcers, that will cause some pain as well. But also think about when we're doing periodontal treatment, the treatment itself can cause some discomfort. So we'll talk about using our pain medications, even if we're just doing periodontal treatment, not extractions. So an owner calls about a dog that has a broken tooth. And if it's very recent, in fact, in just a couple of days, the exposed pulp can be painful because the nerve is exposed. And that nerve transmits impulses to the brain. The brain perceives pain. Once that nerve in the pulp dies, there's no longer that acute pain. This is why we see those broken upper fourth premolars have been broken for a long time, the dog's still eating. And until we get something like an abscess, 
where there's a lot of infection, where there's a lot of inflammation and discomfort, quite often we won't even be able to tell that there's broken a broken tooth. Sometimes an animal will chew more on one side than the other if there is discomfort. And in fact, outside of the inflammation from a chronic abscess, they have been phoenix abscesses described in people where an exacerbation of acute flare-up can cause extreme pain, especially if it can't drain, as in a, a closed abscess. We will also see teeth that might have pulpitis due to blood trauma, but not open the canal. But if that ends up cutting off the blood supply to the pulp and we get a non-vital pulp, then we can still get that infection and that abscess. So it's a little bit of everything with broken teeth. Acute pain, yes. What if we have a mobile slab fracture or really rough edge that's, that's rubbing against the cheek? Then we need to deal with that. And then we certainly need to get rid of anything that be, can be causing that chronic inflammation or infection. When we talk about tooth resorption, the greatest majority of the teeth we see with tooth resorption are the odontoclastic or replacement resorption, and quite often in cats, but we also see it in dogs. Now, as we're looking at these teeth, once we see that gingival change in the crown, then we likely have some discomfort and pain. If we're taking radiographs of these teeth and see there's replacement resorption just in the roots, the initial changes, it's likely non-painful. They see this in people and there's not a lot of pain until it impacts the crown. At that point in time, we have inflamed gum tissue. We have the possibility of getting infected pulps and we really have a tooth that's at risk. About 5% of the teeth that have resorption are actually due to inflammation. Periodontal disease that has caused loss of gum and bone tissue exposed the root, and now we have an inflammatory or very localized type of resorption. But we'll be able to tell this difference on radiographs. Certainly, traumatic injuries are going to cause pain. And last year, about this time, January, February, I think in this period of six weeks, we had 28 calls for jaw fractures. Recently with all the COVID, a combination of people getting new dogs and the big dog not liking the little dog, we get some problems there too. So we see a lot of issues, certainly, uh, when we're looking at any kind of osseous fracture, jaw fracture. We need to evaluate very closely what teeth are involved, if they're fracture teeth or if they have vulse teeth, or if that tooth is in the fracture line and the apex may lose its blood supply, such as the lower fourth premolar, 408 on the radiograph. We might have to deal with soft tissue, either small tears or even avulsions that go along with the jaw and the tooth fractures. On the chronic side, when we see ulcerative disease, we can see a lot of discomfort. This is where periodontal disease goes haywire. As I try to describe to clients, it's almost as if any level of plaque or calculus on the tooth is causing an intense inflammatory, almost allergic type reaction for these patients. And quite often, the only thing that will help will be ex extractions. Certainly when we look at cats with chronic gingival stom stomatitis, that type of inflammation around those teeth but especially in the back of the mouth, if I see the call to mouth inflammation, these cats will not eat. They will be painful. They'll go up to the bowl and start to eat, but then jump back in pain. We also see ulcer ulcerative disease in dogs. More often, we will see more intense inflammation on the buccal mucosa of the cheek that contacts the two surface. Again, the mucosal surface, the contacts plaque and calculus, and now we have an exaggerated immune response. I use the term CUPS, chronic ulcerative periodontal stomatitis. Another term has been used, canine chronic ulcerative stomatitis, kissing lesions, because that's where the, the cheek is contacting these, or contact uh, mucositis. These are extremely painful. They respond to medications at times, but usually we end up having to do extensive extractions. 
Oral tumors can cause pain as well. Sometimes the owner won't notice the tumor until it's so large the animal's chewing on it and causing bleeding and then discomfort. Or if we have osseous changes, when we have a more invasive type tumor that's changing the bone, that tends to cause some pain as well. On these particular patients, depending on what level we're able to proceed with removal or even oncology referrals, if there's, there's a few that respond to radiation therapy, very few that respond to chemotherapy, but we don't just think about getting the tumor out. We think about pain management as well on these. And to be honest with you, I try to reach for Peroxicam and get that compounded out for smaller animals or the 10 milligram dose for bigger animals. We'll talk about that later. Not just for the pain and inflammation, but it does seem to have a bit of a tumor effect. Another chronic pain syndrome we see is kind of unique in cats, a feline oral pain syndrome. And a strong percentage of these, 80% plus are Burmese cats. Initially, it may be seen in kittens as they're teething, and then once they get older. And this has been identified as a neuropathic disorder, primarily with the desensitization of the trigeminal nerve, which basically innervates all the teeth out there. Triggers include any type of dental disease. And since teething kittens go through that process in about two months, that's a pretty good trigger. Then as they're older, if they do have dental disease, that can be a trigger for this pain syndrome, or it's been identified with different stresses as well. We might even have chronic pain that's a little less distinct. Uh, dogs that are pawing at their face, grinding their teeth, rubbing their head against the floor. Sometimes we can't find a specific reason for these. We take our x-rays and we don't find an abscess tooth or a broken jaw or something that we know we can fix easily with surgery. As we look at these patients, we also like to rule out any problems with the TMJ and with the ears as well, with the bulla, tympanic bulla. So we need to do a complete evaluation of the head and neck, make sure there isn't any problems with the uh, neck as well. Sometimes it's a behavioral type issue. There's one for you, Bonnie. Um, you know, maybe they get into a, a, a type of behavior and there can be some discomfort, but it just kind of builds up there. Usually we consider that there again is some type of neuropathy happening and we have to deal with the comfort of the patient and find out what they respond best to. So we're going to go back to talking about surgery and over the years, I think we have come miles in how we're providing better pain management for our surgical patients. We start out with preoperative protocols, uh, something that will provide some sedation, but then we also look at how many pain medications we can use in a multimodal approach. Opioids are always gonna be our list, even when it's tough to find them. If it's appropriate for a patient, we'll look at NSAIDs, we'll look at alpha-2s, and we'll even be adding in meropotent. In our practice, we've been using a combination of a low-dose hydro, a low to, uh, high dose of midazolam as our pre-anesthetic injection, just to kind of help get them a little more comfortable and get them a little happier, and we take it from there. So when we look at this preoperatives, with the opioid, I prefer using the full mu agonist. I like combining it with some mild sedative or tranquilizer. Uh, buprenorphine can be used. I'm not real fond of butorphanol unless I need the sedation because it doesn't last very long for my analgesia and it can help reverse some of the others. Fentanyl can be used preoperatively if, placed, if the patch is placed on long enough in advance or with injection, but I do have some concerns because I've seen quite a bit of lethargy and inappetence with it. Certainly with the opioids, in addition to using them preoperatively, we can look at them with some of the CRI combinations and even the longer term ones as well. 
If I'm going to reach for my NSAID preoperatively, I want to have a patient with good renal function and good blood pressure. If I do have any concerns about a lower blood pressure during my procedures or renal concerns, and let's face it in dentistry, I see a lot of older patients with some issues, then I might uh, administer after recovery or send it home. We have a lot of good choices. I mentioned paroxicam for tumors. If I'm gonna be working up a tumor removal and have any concerns about the invasiveness of this tumor discomfort with the tumor, I might go ahead and start with paroxicam, might have to compound it out for my smaller animals, 0.03 mg per kg once a day, but I need to make sure that I have a washout too. I don't want to put it right on to piggyback it to another NSAID. And we can take it from there. A uh, high dose of midazolam I use for pre-op surgery. Ah, we have a sheet, an Excel spreadsheet, and it's comp computed into that each time. I might have to get back with you on that question. Okay. Alpha-2 agonists. If I have a heart patient, I'll shy away from it. But there are a lot of times I'm reaching for a microdose of that alpha-2 of the dextomator. I tell you what, uh, combining it with our other pre-meds, uh, using the lower doses, using those microdoses, if I have any problems with it, I can always reverse it. Uh, I do make sure we monitor blood pressure well, but except for my really car cardiac cases, or my older ones, we use a lot of these small doses. It really helps to smooth out these patients uh, preoperatively within the operative period as well, and certainly in that postoperative stage with the dysphoria. If we do have those dysphoric dogs and we had to reverse them earlier, they get another microdose if they're having problems with recovery. If you've never seen it, go on YouTube, and I believe it's just Dextomator Remix. It's a, it's a clinic, it has to be from the East Coast. I'm not even sure who they are, but it's a really neat, just fun way to look at. If you have concerns about it, you reverse it. But using these smaller doses can help out with a lot of our patients and it potentiates pain relief as well. We've also been pre-medicating most of our patients with a meropidant. It's difficult as a dental referral practice sometimes to get it dispensed to the patient, but if, you, if they do have it on hand, if they do dispense it, they can take it the night before. If they don't, then we try to get it to them early in the morning, at least an hour or two before surgery if we can. But as we look at this, not just from the nausea, but the substance P inhibitor, it has been shown to decrease our inhalant requirements and to smooth out recovery. So, in my mind, I think Serenia is the veterinarian's uh, coconut oil, but hey, if it works and you're doing well with it, use it. Now, once we've got them pre-medicated, now we have them under anesthesia, now we're going to start cutting or we're going to start root planing, not just cutting. If you're doing periodontal treatment, you're going to be doing any kind of gingival flaps or gingiv gingivoplasty, gingivectomy, or deep root planing. Think about your blocks. So any surgical ex uh, procedure, extractions, trauma repair, if I do have to do a maxillectomy or mandibulectomy, we're certainly using our regional local blocks. The one thing I would say is with small dogs and cats, you do watch your total dose. And we'll talk about that in just a minute. But if I can get a good intra intraoperative block in, I can use less general anesthetic. I can keep the patient a little bit lighter and they'll be more comfortable on recovery. So it's really important. When we're using these local anesthetics, it works on both a transmission and transduction. Remember that pain pathway, sodium channels. You can memorize all of that portion. The key is less general anesthetic, smoother recoveries, they'll be more comfortable and as we look at some of our longer acting local anesthetics, not just the immediate post-operative period, but even up to 72 hours. And in people looking at these longer acting locals and these local combinations shows an increased return to function and decreased recuperative period. 
So the most common ones used, lidocaine, bupivacaine. I don't get the lidocaine out too often, I'll be honest with you. I'm a Marcaine fan. I prefer using the 0.5% that is pre-mixed with epinephrine, one to 200,000, pretty low dose. This has been hard to get. We've had to go to the ampules and draw it out of the ampules or use that funny looking silver syringe that dentists use. With my bupivacaine, I go no more than one mig per kg on cats. So 11 pound cat is one cc total. If I've used anything, I will use lidocaine for intubation, little, little drop on the, on the larynx there. Then I take that out of the total dose. I can use a little bit more on dogs. People have talked about combining these two to get the quickness of lidocaine with the longer acting bupivacaine, but it's shown that that doesn't really help out that much. So when you've got your patient, you've identified areas you're gonna be working on, get your blocks in early, get your x-rays, get your blocks in. That way, five to 10 minutes, you'll have your bupivacaine working and it's gonna work longer than your lidocaine will. Now we've got the options with having longer acting analgesia. And there are times I will add one part buprenorphine to nine parts bupivacaine. So basically I'll take out one tenth buprenorphine, nine tenths bupivacaine, and I'll squirt the nine tenths into my one tenth one cc syringe to help mix it up a little bit better. Using this potentiated bupivacaine can extend analgesia 24 to 72 hours, which it's, it's variable depending on the patient. What has shown more consistency with that up to 72 hours has been the liposomal injectable suspension, no CETA. It's on back order. At least we can't get it right now. The actual mix per kg are a little bit different, but the total amount used, I tend to keep the same. And as I use this block, I've been using it in dental blocks. There's a gradual release of bupivacaine from these liposomes. That's how we get the extended use. Couple of uh, white papers and couple information here. They now had the uh, 10 milliliter vial. And there's a white paper that shows stability of lysosomes and no problems with sterility. We'll use our bottle up to four hour, four days, I'm sorry, instead of four hours, okay? So that's with the Noceta. I want to cover a little bit of intraoperative blocks, but just a couple hints on some of my favorites and why I use certain, certain blocks. Infraorbital is a common one. Caudal maxillary for the maxilla, maxilla is a little bit more effective. Caudal mandibular block is the inferior alveolar nerve block and mental block a little further forward. You do need training. You need to be comfortable with some of these deeper blocks. I'd recommend that you go to Skulls Unlimited International and get some skulls. Now, don't type in skulls on your search and hit search. It's, there's some really weird people out there. So Skulls Unlimited International my best source for having skulls. They have all kinds of stuff on there, great gifts. Um, even if you can't, for some reason, get a good deeper block, maybe there's infection around the side or maybe you start to do the collar maxillary block and you pull back blood and you don't wanna inject into a vessel. At the very least, you can infiltrate into the mucosa above the tooth you're going to be working on or area. Once you've done your flap and have exposed bone, you can do a little infiltration there. In some operations, such as maxillectomies, they talk about using soaker hoses. The key is you want to get the block, the local anesthetic around the nerve. I love the term perineural. It means somewhere around the nerve. So we've all been taught about the infraorbital block. As you palpate the rostral opening near the third premolar, which is absent on this skull, you're not to advance the needle any further than the medial canthus and not get into any nerves or, or vessels in there. So it's possible to gently insert your needle. I tend to do it at the dorsal aspect when I did this, rotate the needle, slow infiltration. If you get it at that distal aspect of the canal, that's near the pterygoid palatine fossa, 
that uh, periorbital flap, and that will help desensitize most of the maxillary teeth. You can also place a catheter to advance that material at that distal aspect of the canal. The thing of it is, as you place the needle in, you're not able to get all the maxillary teeth. And if you have a cat or a brachycephalic patient, the eyeball's right there, all right? So getting material just at the front of that canal will mainly get soft tissue forward and it's not gonna be as effective as a block. So in looking at the maxillary teeth, we talk about doing a call to maxillary block. There has been a description of using your needle where this arrow is going in, called it to the last molar, directing the needle dorsally and then trying to turn it somewhat rostrally but again, there has been reports of damaging the eye, injecting into the globe itself. Approaching from this aspect allows you to get blockage of these molars, but there's a little safer way to approach this. And this is where having the skulls, both of a regular dog and a brachycephalic and a cat. So you can see what you, where you need to deposit this material. So I approach this maxillary block from a caudal approach I keep my needle and syringe parallel to the paddle bone and slip that needle just inside, just underneath the zygoma, but staying slightly above the palatal bone. This is a subzygomatic approach. As I aim it towards the opposite nostril, in, in other words, a little bit medially, then I can infiltrate at the back aspect of that infraorbital canal at the pterygoid palatine fossa and I can continue to infiltrate a little bit that will get the branches going to these molars behind that, caudal to that canal. All right, so that's my version of the caudal maxillary block. Mental block, I like it because it's what I have on many days, mental blocks. When you're doing a mental block, you're applying your local anesthetic at the middle mental foramina of the mandibular canal. It's right there at the front. If you just apply at this area, you'll get soft tissue forward, for sure. This block has had a pretty large variability in how effective it is. And that's with good technique. Now with a larger dog, if I have a small needle, if I can gently advance into that middle mental foramen, the canine tooth apex is right in that area. And within that mental foramina, in that mandibular canal, I think we'll be able to get some infiltration that can help out. But again, it's less sure than if you were to do a complete mandibular block. So the collar mandibular block we look at coming from the extra oral approach. I'm gonna go down to the next slide that you palpate from with your non-dominant finger, palpate the last molar. You figure out where the angular process is. You can palpate that and on a line in between these two is the distal aspect of the mandibular canal. You can come up through the skin with your needle to approach this caudal opening and put your block in that area. If it's placed correctly, then this should impact the entire mandible. The thing we have to be cautious about, although it hasn't happened too often, but when it happens to you, you'll know about it, is that if you put too much volume there, it's gonna infiltrate in a wider area. You can get the lingual nerve on that side of the tongue. And if you do it bilaterally, then the entire, tongue may be desensitized. So you do need to watch these postoperatively. I do a lot of bilateral blocks on the mandibles and I just make sure I get my block amount right next to the bone at that caudal opening of the mandibular canal and try not to spread the volume all around that sublingual area. So Again, if you can't safely perform a deeper regional block, at least get some of the local agent in the buccal mucosa up 
above the attached gingiva. Attached gingiva closest to the tooth, if you've ever tried to put a local block there, it's very difficult because it's closely attached to the bone underneath. So I'll usually do a line block in the softer, looser buccal mucosa above the site. And then once that flap is raised, you can infiltrate more, more local anesthetic. Now I'm just gonna briefly cover uh, some other things that can be used intraoperatively. And I know we, we don't use these as often as we could. And it's something we're working at our practice about using some CRIs. Combinations of using the ketamine with an initial loading dose and then a low dose with that constant rate infusion with or without lidocaine, with or without the opioid, the MLK type CRIs. There are some really good combinations out there. And with using the opioids, you can use very small amounts to make effective pain relief throughout the procedure. And in some of our more, our more advanced procedures, this can be very helpful. Now, I'm no expert in figuring these out, but there is a nice little website, VAASG, actually it just goes by VASG.org that has everything from CRI calculators on the left-hand side, information by drugs, information by categories. This is not, not done by a boarded anesthesiologist, but my friends who are anesthesiologists says this guy's done a good job with these. So I really like this little website. It has some good CRI calculations. So we've got our patient through the operative phase. Now we need to look at post-operative. If we had them, have had them on different NSAIDs, make sure there's a washout time for paroxicam. If they've already been on a different NSAID like uh, Medicam, Meloxicam, or uh, Carprofen, then I'll let them get passed through the initial time frame for surgery until I try that washout to switch over to paroxicam. Kitty cats, uh, we send home buprenorphine, a little bit lower dose than I've seen some of. 10 pound cat usually gets 0.1 mil mucosal absorption. They usually do pretty well. This is especially important with our stomatitis kitty cats that we've done a lot of extractions on, but we've also used either the bupivacaine with buprenorphine or the noceta on those animals. So we have a longer local effect as well. Gabapentin we've used a number of reasons. We've used it for preoperatively for cats, uh, the fear-free type things. And we've used it as combinations with our regular pain protocols, or if we have to get them onto a long-term pain protocol, wind up. How much washout period between NSAIDs? Um, usually do seven days and gabapentin in between from the answer. I'm comfortable with 48 to 72 hours, as long as they haven't shown any problems with the NSAID itself, and then watching them very closely. Okay, and the biggest thing about paroxicam is that uh, gastrointestinal issues, and there's even some combinations with um, the paroxicam with people. Now, I'm not a tramadol fan. I never really have been. The data that shows that very few dogs really have the ability to have the pharmacokinetics to use this. It's a controlled drug. I'd like to be a trusting person, but there's some people out there who are just not trustworthy. If they're needing a lot of tramadol for something, we send them to a pain management specialist and find out if we can do something else for pain. So we tend not to do a lot of uh, tramadol on dogs. It's actually more effective in cats, but it's bitter. Good luck on getting that in a cat. There's other things we look at beyond just our direct pain medications. We make sure they cannot self-traumatize their face. And no, the cone of shame is not fun. It can be quite uh, challenging for some, but if it keeps them from traumatizing that surgical area, it's a must. And there's lots of variations these days. You can get the inflatable ones, you can get the ones that make them look like daisies. So whatever they need to do. Uh, for kitty cats, we'll send home that, that um, Gab a pen to make them happy and trazodone for everybody. Any dog that seems to have any anxiety needs to have a little, little bit less energy, we'll go with that. 
One of the simple things we tell people is cool compresses, especially the first 24 hours. And you might not get a dog to keep a bag of peas on their face, but uh, take a washcloth, get it wet, wring it out, put it in the freezer, let it freeze, take it out, let it get a little bit softer and see if the patient will let you use that on their face. Now we've been looking at post-operative protocols. We've got some data with the Assisi loop looking at the um, TEMPF. And the issue here is we're looking in ways of how to get it around the head post-operatively when these patients are a little bit uncomfortable. Uh, certain modalities such as acupuncture, we'll talk about the chronic pain as well. But once they've recovered from surgery, and if they're still having chronic pain, what I'm gonna even say here is chronic inflammation, especially as we look at stomatitis cats, especially if we're looking at neuropathic inflammation, then we need to can still consider what to do with these patients. So my stomatitis kitty cats, if I have a two week recheck and they're look, looking better than they did two weeks before. This cat was a lot better than it was two weeks before, but we still have an inflammation. I'm gonna make sure that if they're eating okay, we'll still do another recheck at some point in, in time. Um, if there's still some issues, then we definitely start some additional medication or sooner if they're not, if they're not eating well. And don't forget to weigh them in at this two week recheck. If they're already starting to lose a bit of weight, that's, that's tough on cats. If it's just appetite, we can use certain stimulants, but if it is inflammation, we need to get them through this painful inflammatory phase. And sometimes they'll even be refractory. Uh, University of Wisconsin, they've been looking at administering doxycycline 25 to 50 milligrams once a day and that's kind of cat size, big cat, little cat, I guess. We tend to go to 25 and if they're less than about eight to nine pounds and 50 if they're greater. You can get small flavor chews. Um, we've generally done that, fish, tuna, things like that. Some people think marshmallow is a cat favorite. I haven't had my cats like them, but you never know. And certainly as we look at combination of chronic pain, we'll look at gabapentin. Chronic inflammation, I'll look at seeing if they can apply the 1TDC. They get it online. It's a serified fatty acid, but they have to apply it daily to the gingiva. Let's see how the cat will do with that. And I've even looked at the microlactin products such as Duralactin Feline on these, again, to help with the inflammation as well as the pain. The chronic pain of feline oral pain syndrome, particularly in those Burmese, Certainly you need to make sure there aren't, aren't dental issues and you wanna reduce stress, the environment, pheromones, any of the fear-free type issues there. Any use of NSAIDs or corticosteroids tend to have limited effect. And once they're stopped, sometimes they'll rebound. What seems to have helped the most on these patients has been anticonvulsants such as phenobarbital. So along those lines, they feel the neuropathic, neurogenic type pain with these particular uh, patients, although other, other combinations have been used as well. Again, gabapentin, use for seizures, chronic pain, that may be appropriate for some of these cats. We can even have chronic pain if we've had previous TMJ injuries, if we've had luxations, if we've had fractures, anything like that that can cause enough damage to the TMJ joint that it can cause some arthritis and even eventual ankylosis. When we're evaluating these patients, we're gonna be looking at the amount of range of motion and see if that's been decreased. We're gonna listen with our stethoscope as we open and close the mouth to hear any grinding or clicking and certainly radiographs, but advanced imaging especially, particularly looking at the joint itself, but also the retrobulbar region. Now, I just wanted to share this quick picture with you. On this young cat, we had had a uh, TMJ luxation that we were able to reduce and we actually used sewing buttons, labial buttons, two maxillary, one right, one left, one, one mandibular in the center, 
and we use heavy suture material in between these buttons, both sides bilaterally, to allow the mouth to open to a certain extent, but not too much. So we don't want to splint this mouth closed because we want the TMJ to work after luxation, but we don't want them to open up the mouth so wide that it's going to reluxate. So this is a method we use both in young animals for fra when we have fracture repairs that we need to limit their, their oral use or with the post TMJ. Chronic pain management, we've mentioned gabapentin a couple times. I don't use it as a standalone for pain. I definitely use it for cats for fear-free visit. It can make some happy cats out there. But if we anticipate chronic pain, starting them on before it winds up too bad, or even once it has wound up, looking at a multimodal approach, going with a primary pain management, NSAID, such as osteoarthritis, then adding in the gabapentin. And when I'm doing for this long term, I'd like to start it gradually, gradually build up. So I'll start at a lower dose, have them give it at night because it can make them a little bit sleepy, a little bit goofy. Then go to once a day, twice a day, then slowly increase up to 10 milligrams twice a day per kigs twice a day. And I find what value makes that patient most comfortable. When you're doing this gradual buildup, never stop abruptly if it's uh, uh, chronic pain. And uh, you have to watch it a little bit because it is becoming a scheduled drug in some states because it potentiates other illegal pharmaceuticals. So hopefully that won't happen with everybody. But one quick thing, someone asked what peroxicam, 0 0.3 mg per kg, okay? I believe I'll, I'll have to I'll have to double check that, but I'm pretty sure it's the 0.3. Okay. So if you're looking at for the Proxicam, if you're looking at about a 70 pound dog, that's going to be about 33 kigs. The 0.3, you can use the 10 milligram human dose. That's how we remember it. Now, also with chronic pain management, we look at complementary methods. Physical therapy, physical treatment, acupuncture. There's a lot of modalities out there that I think continue to build both acceptance and good data. And one of these include using the targeted pulse electromagnetic fields. There are studies with osteoarthritis. There are studies with post-surgical uh, patients. And as we look at these uh electromagnetic field studies, we also extrapolate from some human studies as well. Because as you're within that loop, within that field, nitrous, nitric oxide production is enhanced, increases blood flow, modulates cytokines. So we get a decreased pain and inflammation edema, increased tissue repair when we're looking at our post-operative. So there are coils that make a treatment field and the area must be within this field to be treated. Usually look at 15 minute treatments, twice a day to start, and that can adjust from there. Unless there's an auto cycle type thing, once you press the button, you have a 15 minute treatment and each device have, has a certain number of treatments in there. So the studies that have shown with the hemolamalectomy, go and say that fast three times. So pain perception, 50% regain towards zero for the control group, proprioception, lower spinal cord injury biomarker levels, and statistically significant less pain. Then as you look at the other study, nearly 50% reduction, reduction in opioids needed, post-op wound healing, faster return to function. This is something that is really a key parameter that they look at with people studies because a quicker return to function means quicker return to functionality and back to work. And it's a money thing with people, definitely. 
So with some of our smaller patients, we can use a loop lounge. And in some of my stomatitis patients, we've been going with this. You can get a total body treatment on these patients and the smaller sizes can fit in the sleepy pod carriers or on some of the covers. And it can be used with some of these smaller patients. Because the loop lounge works a little bit better with the cat, trying to find out the way to keep the region within the loop for treatment can be a little challenging. Coming up with some good ideas. We're always looking for uh, good, good responses. I don't know if anybody has seen this air muzzle for cats. It's a pretty interesting little device uh, invented by a veterinarian. Can help with blood draws and there's even a piece you can put on for nebulizers. We're also going to look for inflammation at treatment. Remember, I talked about inflammation. It's not just about pain. It's not just about infection. It's about the inflammation. And that's why with the stomatitis cats, the low-dose doxycycline is not being used for its antibacterial properties. It's because it's anticollagenase. It's why cyclosporin has been used for certain stomatitis patients. It's why the microlactin that works against the winding up the neutrophils to help with the inflammation and the 1TDC with the oral inflammation and osteoarthritis. So as we look at these patients, we look at every aspect. We look at combating the infection. We look at doing surgical treatment with pre, peri, post pain management. We look at chronic management. We look at using any type of modality that's appropriate for that patient. Because when we can give these patients relief from pain, provide analgesia, we are definitely impacting their quality of life.